Welcome to another in the series of NJPM webinars. Megan Altman was to be the interviewer today, but she had to attend to an emergency legal matter that is heading to court. Before introducing Gabrielle Stritch, a few preliminary matters. We have attendees today from Australia, New Zealand, and several US states. So NJPM is getting national and international exposure. As to today, you can use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. Please do that at any time. About 15 minutes into the interview, I'll stop and answer at least some of your questions. We will finish with the questions at the end of the interview. Now as to our uh, speaker today. Gabrielle Stritch is the principal of the Stritch Law Firm that emphasizes elder, estate, family and employment law. She also provides mediation services in those areas. She was trained as a mediator at Seton Hall University and is accredited by NJPM. She is a member of the Alternative Dispute, Family and Elder Law sections of the New Jersey State Bar Association. Uh, welcome, Gabrielle. Thank so, you, good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. So first question, what is elder mediation? Well, elder mediation is mediation of elder law issues. So we then get to what are elder law issues? So uh, the most common thing one thinks of when you think of elder law is you have a mature person, if I may use that terminology, uh, that is in distress and they're unable to live alone and manage all their affairs on their own. Um, it could be a mental disability, a physical disability, or both. But to be purely on their own, they can't do it. And then the question is, how can we handle that in a way that's appropriate for that person? Let me just stop you right there. When you say that a person can't do that, is one of the things you mediate is whether there's agreement that all the parties that this person can't do that? That's correct. Um, that's a very good point. So it is not always clear whether the person can manage on their own or not. Um, it's important to a lot of people to be independent. And there is the philosophy in the court, for example, if it gets to the point of guardianship, that you wanna take away as little rights as possible. So if they can sign their name, but to manage all the financials and really see what's owed, what's not owed, what's already been paid is too much, one can arrange for a bill payer, for example, that would come in, go over everything, write out the checks, but the person would go over it with the person and they would sign the checks so that they still have a feeling of autonomy. But a, a big, there's certainly um, usually what's involved uh, often there's only a single parent and then you've got the children that sort of have to step up to the plate to determine the situation assess what's needed and what's not needed and the question is whether the person in question is competent and is able to make decisions on their own and be very much part of the process so uh, you know, that's the first question is, do they need help? Now, this is when you are in what I call at least crisis or semi-crisis situation. The problems occurred and we got to do something about it, physically, emotionally, financially. So, as you say, there, the big problem with siblings is you have 50 years of sibling rivalry. And... Everybody thinks the other person was favored, got more money, yada, yada. Uh, one person has very different viewpoints than the other. One person thinks, let's save as much money so we get more when mom dies. So she can, you know, let's have her live in one of our homes because that's the cheapest way of doing it. Well, that person will have to manage, will come in and chip in. Another person, no, that's not the right solution. The right solution is put to have mom go to say assisted living and she'll be in a beautiful environment with other people and there'll be care right there and we can all visit her and have oversight and it'll just be a much healthier environment for her. Another person is, are you kidding me? The person, she can't even get dressed anymore. Um, you know, she can't get in and out of her wheelchair anymore. We're really talking nursing home level. 
So first, the first thing I do is uh, try to get um, a consensus as to what the questions are that they have and what their concerns are and how do I go about doing that. Uh, so there's a different technique than traditional mediation where say you have a couple that's getting a divorce in front of you. Um, you I'm sure you've heard of the past the stone technique or I'm sure there's other names for it but you have to establish rules up front as to how you're gonna be able to help them effectively. And make sure everybody understands that everyone's gonna be listened to, everyone's gonna have a chance to express their concerns on all the topics in question, but everyone has to take their turn. So the first, the first thing, I, a lot of times I'll use a big um, poster and write notes or a blackboard and write notes, or I'll even type it on my computer because me writing notes means nobody can read it. My handwriting is horrendous. So um, often I will type, I'll get, I'll go one person by one person to get, what are your concerns? What are your questions? Like, what are, what's an issue here, right? And then I will type it out as they're talking and I'll project it on the wall so everybody can see what it is we need to address. And then um, commonly, then we need to get resources to get some answers to our questions. And it's very common for me in that situation to bring in a geriatric social worker. That's someone who has a social work degree but has a specialty in geriatrics. And they, uh, they are, and sometimes they're nurses who have specialized in this and sometimes they're social workers. And they have the skills and the knowledge to go to see mom or dad, meet with each of the children, and evaluate from a medical slash social work perspective what the parent can and can't do and what kind of accommodations are needed so that they will come back with a recommendation. Really the right place for mom is assisted living because um, her house has stairs, there's no bathroom downstairs, um, you know, uh, there's, it's, she lives in an over 55 community, so it's not possible to like do an addition. They don't allow those things, all those, that kind of thing as a practical matter. Now, when you were talking about the meeting where you would be writing things on the flip chart or wherever, now, who were the parties at that meeting? Ah, so typically you have a uh, son and son's wife, daughter and daughter's wife second son and second son's uh, spouse and, and maybe a single uh, child. Um, maybe an, uh, uh, if the parent is able to come and would like to participate, we'd like to have them there. It's their life, we want them involved. And, we, and it's gonna be really emphasized how important it is for everyone to stay calm and to take their turn because we don't want this to be an upsetting experience for anyone, least of all the parent in question. When you say you'd like them to be there, aren't they an essential part of it? The elderly? Of course people. they are, but sometimes okay. they're not competent. Oh, okay. And, um, or sometimes physically, it's not possible uh, for them to be there. Um, you know, I'm certainly willing to go to the home but then it's, um, you know, the question is, are there appropriate, is there a place to be in an appropriate setting to get this done mm -hmm. in the hall? Um, most commonly it is in my office. So uh, I certainly have uh, handicap accessibility in my office. Um, getting up to my office and in my office and at my office all has handicap accessibility. So if, but sometimes the person is in a state where that's, even just getting in a wheelchair isn't feasible. Okay. Now, going back, you, you talked about some of the matters. I don't think you can finish the list. Not at all. I just got okay. sort of started on the crisis okay. situation. And not only do we have to address the physical arrangements and the emotional feelings of everybody, um, but we also have to address the legal and the financial issues. So of course we have to find out, well, the first question is, is the parent in question competent? And there's 
Of course, I'm not qualified to make that determination, except that I like to think I have common sense, just like everyone listening to this webinar. So uh, I had a woman come in uh, with her three sons and I, she was in a wheelchair and I started chatting to her and I said, how many sons do you have? And she very proudly told me, I have three sons. And what are their names? She could not tell me her na their names and they're sitting right there. Okay. So really in a matter of 30 seconds, I was pretty clear from her demeanor and what she said and didn't say that in my mind, using common sense, she was not competent. And that creates all kinds of special legal problems that do have to be addressed. Um, you have to, the first question is, is there a power of attorney? Has it, such a document be done? And what does it include and what doesn't it include? I need to look at it. And if it's one of your little basic page and a half power of attorneys, it's really not gonna be sufficient. It's gonna be a problem. It doesn't have HIPAA rights in it. I mean, how can the children make educated decisions about their mom when they're not entitled to any medical information? You know, it just not, doesn't work. So, but I can't do a new power of attorney if the person's already incompetent. To do a power of attorney, the person granting that power must be competent. Sometimes I've had people come in and I'm not sure using common sense. So then I need, they need to be evaluated by either a medical doctor or a PhD psychologist or EDD or equivalent, of course. And there, um, there are several levels of tests. The first level is called a mini mental. And it's a series of questions. And they're, they really tell you a lot. Um, uh, the doctor will know. And there's, the doctor has to fill out an affidavit as to whether they're competent or not. If they're not competent and there is an inadequate power of attorney or no power of attorney, which is commonly the case. So I hope if everybody watching this, if they don't do anything else after watching this, they got to go make sure that not only they have power of attorneys for themselves and they're at sufficient level, but that their parents do. And you will thank me forever when something comes up. <laughs> okay. So if unfortunately there is no power of attorney or the power of attorney is inadequate, we then have to file in court for guardianship. No one has authority to admit the person. No one has authority to make decisions about the person medically or otherwise. It's a mess, okay? So guardianship is a fairly complex legal proceeding, but many elder law um, attorneys, most elder law attorneys do guardianship. But of course that would not be part of mediation, but you need to be aware of that issue and what, has, what your choices are. So you also have to see, is there a will? What is the breakdown of assets? How are we gonna pay for what we're proposing? And you have to come up with plans for all that. So you need a power of attorney, you need a will. I mean, if they have no assets, you don't need a will, okay? Um, and you need, um, uh, you need to talk about uh, advanced health directives because obviously if they're there in this crisis or semi-crisis situation, that's what if, you know, they have the heart attack, they have the stroke, something happens, and they have to rush to the hospital, what do they want done, what don't they want done? Again, not possible once they're incompetent, but if they're competent, definitely possible. We need to make sure all those legal documents are in place. Again, mediators aren't, unless they're elder lawyers as well, are not going to be doing that, but they need to know that these documents need to be in place, and they should have a cadre of elder lawyers they can refer to to have the family um, get this done. So then um, we also have to talk about financial issues. So we need a breakdown of assets, liabilities, where are they located, how are they titled, are there beneficiaries named, et cetera. And then, we and then we have to talk about how we're gonna pay for whatever care or modifications to the house or whatever else is needed, right? So let's say that okay, mom could get by with um, someone for six hours a day for now, but according to our expert, say the geriatric social worker, it's a matter of time before substantially more care will be needed. And there will be, a, let's say the person has MS, it's a degenerative disease. 
And what happens is first they, you know, need a walk, a, a cane, and then a walker, then they need a wheelchair, then they can't even be in a wheelchair, they literally fall out. It's terrible. And there's a lot of terrible diseases out there like this. And so, you know, in those cases, it's a matter of when. And so you have to plan for this. Um, and if there are, if, if the person has $3 million, okay, especially if they're $3 million liquid dollars, not just tied up in real estate, then they can pay for their care, okay? But if they don't, then the average nursing home cost in New Jersey is at least, that's average, there's definitely more, 13000 a month. That adds up really fast. So how are we going to pay for it? And then we start talking about Medicaid and how to plan for that, what can be done to preserve assets, what can't be done to preserve assets, what are the choices, et cetera, et cetera. So there's an awful lot involved in Medicaid planning and really only elder law attorneys know about that. Um, and I think, you know, you, in my opinion, I'm prejudiced, but uh, I believe that if you're gonna mediate in an area, you need to know something about that area because you can't ask the right questions and you can't even, you know, while you can't, if you're mediating, you can't give direct legal advice. I think you need to be able to know what questions to ask. And sometimes you need to be able to give options. That's my view. Not everybody would agree with me, but that's what I see. So, um, you know, that's one thing we do. That's a crisis situation. But what if you're, Okay, I have to tell you my definition for elder has really changed. You know, when I was in my 20s, I thought you were middle-aged when you're 30 and 40, forget about it, life was over. So I don't see it that way anymore, needless to say. Uh, now I think you don't hit middle age till 50 and you're not older till 80. But if someone comes in 60 or older, even though you're still only middle-aged, um, at that point, you need to be thinking about if, because you have to say, well, what's the chances it's going to happen to me, right? That I'm going to need long-term care. Well, the chance is approximately 75%. Three out of four. That's huge. So it's highly likely to happen. And if you don't plan for it, you're exhibiting what I call the ostrich phenomenon. It's when you stick your head in the sand and hope nobody notices your rear end is sticking out. So, um, when somebody hits 60, we need to get the right documents in place at that point. So if somebody comes in when they're 20 and want a power of attorney, I'm gonna do a very simplistic power of attorney because that's what's needed for somebody that age. If somebody comes 60 or older, we really need to have the full, I have spend down provisions in there, I have HIPAA rights, I have um, gifting. If you don't specify gifting, in a power of attorney, you cannot do it. People don't realize the agent cannot do it. So you need a different kind of set of documents as you mature. Now this sounds all very legalistic. So as a mediator, are you finding that most of the people who are doing this type of mediation are lawyers? Yes. Okay. But you don't, do I think you have to be? No, I really don't think you have to be because um, in terms of planning ahead of time and getting everybody on the same page, again, you could have disagreements. They are less likely, in my opinion, the clients, meaning the children and possibly the spouse, are less likely to be in agreement to go to a mediator when there's no crisis and they're just doing estate and elder law planning. But certainly one could, um, you know, not everybody agrees even at that stage. <laughs> so, it, you know, there's certainly an opportunity for a mediator in that setting. But most typically, an elder mediator gets involved in two settings. One, the crisis or semi-crisis that we discussed at the beginning. And two, when something's already in litigation. What kind of thing can be in litigation that a mediator can help? One, a contested guardianship. Sister says, or daughter says, I want to be the guardian. Brother says, you shouldn't be the guardian. I should be the guardian. Um, so this, or if it's a grandparent, you have father saying, 
daughter shouldn't be the guardian. I should be the guardian. I'm the son, right? So, um, and it gets really, really ugly where literally family members are suing each other. And obviously this is terrible to, I mean, it's terrible even for a lawyer, let alone, let alone for the family. And if there's a skilled mediator that can get everybody together, say, wait, 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 let's, calm down, let's see if we can get the family on the same page and resolve, you know, what needs to be done. Um, you know, there's two types, there's two basic types of guardianship. There's a, well, there's full guardianship, there's financial guardianship, and there's guardianship of the person. And sometimes it makes sense for somebody to do all of it. Sometimes it makes sense to break up those roles. So all this can be mediated and resolved on hopefully avoid court if that's a dispute, or if they're already in court, I've had cases that have gone to mediation on that issue to see if we can resolve things without continuing in the litigation. Where do you, uh, let me ask you, how do you usually get your business? Is it referrals from attorneys? Is it people, are they people just calling you? Uh, how does it usually originate? Well, first of all, you'd be surprised. Quite you know, a lot of the divorce community knows that I have the unusual background of family law plus elder. And so if you have a disabled child or a disabled spouse, there are a lot of elder, what I call disability slash elder law issues and, and special things have to be done in the marital settlement agreement. So I have been called in as a mediator for those issues by family lawyers. And um, I might draft a special needs trust. I will certainly mediate, you know, you know, how this is going to be handled, what needs to be done, all that kind of thing. Special language has to be done in the, um, in the uh, marital settlement agreement. So that's one, that's one way I get referrals, matrimonial attorneys, interestingly enough. Mm -hmm. um, also, of course, I give lots of speeches about elder law. I'm very passionate about it. I, I feel everybody should be aware of it because it's so likely it's going to happen to them and their family. And I want people to be educated and to plan ahead of time so they aren't coming to me in crisis. I just, you know, I just feel strongly that I want to give that to the community. Um, but in making those speeches in all kinds of settings, whether, I mean, I speak at synagogues and churches and libraries and um, and, you know, various, I speak at bar functions, um, I've spoken for NGABM before, I'm speaking now. Um, of course, in speaking about this, if people feel I know what I'm talking about, and they would be comfortable with me referring me, then if something comes up, then they're more likely to think of me than just looking at a list in a phone book, as it were. And do those speaking engagements, do you think, generate business for you? They do. Um, it's off, sometimes I will get a call. I heard you speak three years ago kind of thing. And sometimes what, what will happen is somebody will hear me speak and then somebody else will say, oh, I have this kind of problem. And then I'll get the referral that way. So um, I, public, I, I have a membership to Constant Contacts. I have like 2,600 names in my Constant Contacts. And every time I meet somebody new, I'm still adding them. And so when I'm going to speak, I publicize it through constant contact. I send out my flyer on the speech. And that also, um, you know, that makes people, it gives you an air of knowing what you're talking about. And um, uh, it educates people that there is such a thing as elder mediation and, and what kind of situations, you know, might trigger that. And um, people, you know, again, might, even if they don't listen to your speech, they might think of you if a situation comes to their attention involving this, whether it's themselves or a client or a friend or whatever. Um, and uh, courts are a very significant, if you're gonna do probate mediation, which is another type of elder mediation. So what do I mean by that? When somebody dies, they have assets and liabilities. And if there's a will, then you think it'd be straightforward, but then there's contesting the will. And, or sometimes people die without a will, including attorneys with like a million bucks. I've seen that, okay? 
So then there's a question as who's going to be the administrator, um, you know, and how is everything, you know, working out all the detail. And, um, and sometimes people end up in court. Uh, so if, if that starts happening and a family does not want to end up in court, perfect. An elder mediator is perfect for that. If um, it does end up in court, the courts will often refer it to mediation as part of the process. So that's a source of referrals also. So for years now, I've been hearing that elder mediation is going to be the next big market, you know, because there are so many people becoming elderly, so many people would really benefit from having mediation in this area, but it doesn't seem as though it's really happened, or has it happened? Okay. Um, I think it has happened in a very small way. Um, even though the need for elder law is increasing because of the baby boomers, right? Uh, becoming All the baby boomers are becoming of the age where this is an issue. Um, first of all, a lot of people won't recognize that. I've had, sometimes my big service is I get a call from one of the brothers or sisters and they're all upset. We don't agree. We're fighting. We're blah, blah, blah. I said, great. Let's get you all in mediation. And I explain the process. Oh, I like that. Then I explain the cost. Oh, I don't like that. <laughs> so then let me talk to my brothers and sisters. Maybe if they understand what the cost will be to fight about this, maybe we can resolve it on our own. And that's something often that happens also. So uh, it's, it's very difficult to generate the clients in ways other than I've already talked about. Um, you know, people, it's not really that recognized. So we do need, I'm glad we're having this webinar. I'm hoping that more people will become aware there is such a thing as elder mediation and that is a resource for a family that needs to develop a plan for, for mom or dad, hopefully before the crisis and certainly in the crisis, that they can get assistance that way. Well, so obviously you need some rather specialized knowledge to do this successfully, but do you need any skills, mediation skills, that are say different to do this kind of mediation than you might use in civil or divorce? Or are they the same? Well, both. I mean, obviously certain underlying mediation skills, ability to listen, ability to, you know, reframe, ability to get focused on the issues, all the things that mediators do absolutely apply. But it's different than family mediation, which typically is just two, the two parties, possibly could be the two parties and their attorneys. And it's different than civil mediation, which typically is shuttle mediation, you know, where they're with their, most commonly with their attorneys and you're shuttling back and forth. Because here you have a large group that's very emotional, 50 years worth of history, and how do you get them focused on what are the real issues, what are the real options, how do we resolve it? And um, I actually had uh, 40 hours of training um, by the court uh, with uh, an expert from Florida where they had already established this program on uh, large, um, large group mediation, how to do it. Um, and it, it, it's, you know, in a simple, you know, I, I kind of explained it before. You, you need to get everybody feeling like they get heard. You need to outline what the issues are, what are all the concerns, make sure you address all of them. You need to keep control in the room. You need to, um, you know, give everyone a chance to be heard in an orderly fashion on all the issues. Right. So, now, I, I know that when you do civil mediation, you caucus because most people do in civil mediation. Yeah. I know you do in divorce occasionally too. Do you ever caucus when you do this kind of elder mediation? Sure. Absolutely. Like, let's say one person is sort of going crazy, let's say, <laughs> or starts crying. I mean, you know, we've all had that in our different mediations where they really are out of control, if we could put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's important to stop the mediation and get them isolated, get them calmed down. Um, if they're really off the wall in their views and, and I can make a legal argument to them that, 
you know, you're certainly entitled to your view, but you should be aware the framework of the law is X, Y, and Z, and I'm not giving you legal advice, but the kinds of things you're talking about, um, you know, are outside the framework of the law, and you need to be aware of that. Perhaps you should get attorney, you know, your own attorney to get advice on this, you know, and, you know, but we still really want to work it out because you have this, this is advantage if we all find a way to work it out. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had cases where, where one brother kidnapped the mom and took her to another state. I mean, it's unbelievable what people will do. I mean, for real. <laughs> How many other uh, elder mediators do you know? Um, I believe Don Vanarelli does it. And um, Megan is trained, you know, she knows elder law. Both Don and uh, Megan know elder law and both are mediators. So if an opportunity comes up, you know, both of them could could do it, though neither of them have had that group training like I've had. So that's that's only a few people. That's not a, you know, there aren't scores of these around as far as you know. Well, um, there are some people used by the courts. They're on a court, what it, I say a court list. They don't go to the court civil list. Mm -hmm. It's who the uh, chancery judge in each county is comfortable with and has become aware of that has the skill and knowledge. They tend to be attorneys? They tend to be attorneys in that case. Okay, because it seems like an area where the skills of mental health professionals would really be, really be good. That of course yeah. they have to acquire the legal knowledge, but the personal skills would be really good. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Same thing, CPA who would really be able to crunch the numbers. I mean, um, do I think a mediator other than a lawyer can do elder mediation? Absolutely. Okay. Um, what percentage of your practice is engaged in this kind of mediation? Small. Extremely small. Extremely small. So I've had a, uh, one of the, the presiding judge or probate judge in one county has asked me to uh, submit my name and information so that I can be on the list. But um, uh, it's, yeah, it's hard. Uh, it's not that I, sometimes you just, family comes and you don't expect it to be mediation. They mm -hmm. just come for say elder law advice and it sort of turns into um, an informal uh, elder mediation as a practical matter. But uh, in terms of people actually coming in specifically for that, it's very, I don't even think I get a case a year. Okay, so now let me ask for um, anyone who's attending to submit some questions and we will try to answer, well, I won't, Gabrielle will answer the questions. So, uh, so what else do you think is important for mediators to know about this area? Well, I think, I think it's a valuable life area you know, because it's just going to impact almost all of the population. And I think that if one um, gets a word out more about the possibility of elder mediation and what it entails and how we can help a family before it's a real mess and it's litigation, you know, that there will be more work available that way. Um, but it, it's going to take time. I remember in 95, when I really started as a mediator, you know, I, I'd ask people about the mediation alternative and they'd want to know whether, whether, do they know what that is? And they would say, oh, cross the legs and breathe deeply. And which of course is meditation, not mediation. So, you know, then a lot of people didn't even know what mediation was. So it's a matter of educating the public and it would be a real public service for more people to get involved and start educating the public. Any ideas as to how we could do that? Well, I think there could be um, a page on our website just on that topic alone. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we could try to do some seminars that are designed for the public. Okay. Um, like in a library or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you've been working, we've been working as a board on getting more speaking engagements. And when it, we can maybe develop a list of topics that we can speak on, and maybe this is one of the topics we speak on. And it's not going to be something they see every day from other groups. Um, okay, I have a question from Suzanne English. It says, you mentioned an elder care social worker. 
do you see them uh, making, do you see making that, let's see, what is that? Do you see marking them possibility of elder mediation? I'm not sure what that means. Right, see? so they're, I mean, they are a great referral source for this. And uh, sometimes they try to do it themselves and they can't. Um, they think they have the skills because they're social workers and maybe they have some mental health skills, uh, a lot of it, a lot more than me, that's for sure, I'm not trained. But despite that, they they get stuck. Um, so, you know, uh, they're not formally trained as mediators, most of them. So it's good for them to know there's another resource available for their clients okay. um, in these kinds of situations. I misread the question. Oh. So Suzanne is correct in me, it is, do you see marketing to them, social yeah. workers? Uh, they're really a, a strong resource. Okay. And have you done that? Uh, so yes, some. Um, okay. I go to, there are, um, I go to networking meetings that are designed for people that provide services to seniors. They're literally senior service networking meetings. And when, you know, everybody introduces themselves, I talk a lot about doing elder mediation in that setting, for example. And then, you know, of course, I talk to people individually as well. I meet them for lunch or have a conversation, you know, different ways to have conversations with them. Do you ever give presentations at independent living places? Uh, I do, but I haven't done one on elder mediation yet. And uh, that's a helpful comment, and I will add that to my to-do list. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, are there any questions, any more questions out there? So what, what else would you like to add to us today? Um, so I guess the special challenges are that you have so many people in the room at the same time and so many different personalities and psychosis possibly. Uh, though of course I can't diagnose this, I just know the person is acting oddly. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and you have uh, so many years of history and contention. So it just, and you don't have kids in common to work out, like at least in a, a divorce, uh, not always, but most times there are children involved. And if there's a way you can get them on the same page about the children, then it sets the stage for getting them on the same page about finances and the other issues for a divorce. Here, you don't really have that. And when you do try to talk about you know, it, it would be a shame for the family, you know, to be rendered asunder, as it were, um, you know, and, and it, you know, it, it would be really, you know, a tragedy not to have an ongoing long-term relationship with your family members. It's not given the same weight as, um, it's like, I don't want to talk to them anyway, you know, kind of thing. Right. Um, it's not given the same weight as when you start talking about an ongoing relationship with a, someone's children. So um, it's, that's, that's more difficult. And of course, everybody has very, very different perspectives. Okay. We have one other question from Susan Wright. If the documents are in place, mom slash dad starts to show short memory loss. At what point do the children take over? And is mom also insisting she is fine and takes tests, which she passes real indications that she is competent? Okay. Well, first of all, you learn to look for a lot of signs. For example, if you go to the refrigerator and there's all kinds of moldy food in there, that's a bad sign. <laughs> there's a problem there. If, and you'd be surprised if the police get called for domestic violence in the home when they're older, that's because they're frustrated and they only, they strike out at the only person that's there. And so that's a sign. Um, of course, wandering as you know outside the home and not being able to get back—that's a sign. Um, there's lots of of signs. Uh, bills aren't getting paid. Uh, blah blah blah. So um, you can start, and, and yet a lot of people feel really strongly about independence. You know, even when they should have 24/7 care, they don't want. I don't want somebody living in my home. Okay, so we'll have to bring people in. Um, you know, I don't want to go to a facility. I want to stay in my home. That's what everybody feels. Now, you should be aware that staying in your home and having 24-7 coverage 
is way more expensive. That 13,000 months starts looking cheap uh, if you need, you need help 24 seven. It's like 650 a day at least. And that adds up really fast. So 13,000 is bad. That number adds up much faster. And a lot of people can't afford it. So it's um, a lot of times you get the, it's very, very common that the older person will not recognize their limitations and will not be open to um, getting the help they need. And so a mediator could really help uh, in that situation if they can get, um, at least get them to have the mediator come to them or go to the mediator to chat a little bit about everybody's concerns and and, and but very much giving um respecting the older person and what they have to say right well uh gabrielle i really want to thank you it's been a very interesting and informative session today so thank you very much oh my pleasure thank you take care